Today marks our second Business for Better event, and we are delighted to welcome Tristan Fletcher, who came to Sussex and studied a Master's in Evolutionary and Adaptive Systems from 2006 to 2007. Tristan then went on to work in various companies as a researcher and a managing director before co-founding Chai in 2019, which is a company that uses AI techniques and alternative data to forecast prices of commodities. Tristan will be talking to you about his career, the lessons he's learned, and his approach to this idea of business for better now in his talk, which he's titled, Career Also Means Veer From Side to Side. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ruby, and hello, everyone, and thanks in advance for sparing time over what would otherwise be a lunch break to listen to me talk. So I'm Tristan Fletcher, and yes, I'm going to talk to you about what I've learned in my career so far, which depending on how you look at it has either been all over the place or a carefully planned route to doing work I find meaningful, interesting and highly lucrative. I think there's a danger that these talks just end up being a long, boring description of the narrator's career to date in some kind of bio, peppered with a bit of virtue signaling and seen through some heavily rose tinted spectacles. So I've tried to avoid too much of a descent into the minutiae of my professional life and only surface experiences which I think are relevant to the overall theme. I've had a pretty inconsistent, what, what feels like, at least to me, interesting career so far, and wanted to share, massively patronizingly, some of my learnings. Not least because I've been right at the cold face of ultra capitalism, and you might not have many people with that background in these talks. So this is a photo of me at my idealistic peak, to be explained shortly. I had wanted to build a company ever since school, being motivated by autonomy and the desire to build things. And this thread of entrepreneurialism has won all the way through my career to date. I was also not that sure about what I wanted to specialise in or, or do professionally. So choosing a general engineering course felt like a good way of delaying this decision even further. I was very idealistic at this point in my life and also extremely ambitious. So much so on both counts that in my fourth year, I wrote down the list of what I felt were the world's biggest problems in terms of the number of people impacted and the suffering they created and set these against my ability to address them with engineering type solutions. Water supply ended up being at the top of that list. And while other students were counting bean tins in Wolverhampton, I flew out to rural India to try and build a water purifier the developing well to use. I visited many rural slums, as per this photo, and learned many things about water supply and sanitation, and how important politics is at every level in resolving these. And sadly, probably much more than technology itself, I was really naive about the scale of the problem. The fact that I could somehow know more than the millions of people I've previously tried to address it. And other than maybe putting some attention on this problem through my research and the people who funded it, I didn't really end up doing much useful suffering relief. However, I did learn a lot about myself, mainly that I've got the courage to just go after things that seem worthy of exploration, mostly ignoring the probability of success and pursuing them for the sake of finishing. The experience also opened up my eyes a little to international development and how politics and sadly probably wealth or financial resources trumps a lot of other issues when it comes to relieving suffering. So patronizingly, here is lesson number one. When you're young, or at least don't have any obligations or responsibilities, I do think it's really important to just go for or, or even create opportunities without worrying too much about the chance of failure. You're going to regret these chances, or not taking these chances, sorry, much more than the kind of opportunity cost of being a year or two behind in whatever you choose to do anyway. My, my first degree I did at Cambridge, and all the people there were so obsessed about becoming like management consultants or working in investment banks and, you know, wanted to get eke every second out of those careers to get there as quickly as possible. 
And it's great once you know you're going in the right direction. But I think until you know you're going in the right direction, you've got to experiment and ignore those things. And you're never going to be too far behind. Or maybe you like when you're 50 or 60, but not, not early on in your careers. Um, I, and I think also you, you get used to being courageous. And maybe when you're younger, some of that's actually just stupidity and not being aware of the consequences. But courage is a muscle you flex. So it's good to get the habit of leaving your comfort zone earlier on. Anyway, after graduating and trying my hand at many short-lived entrepreneurial ventures, and also a job in the city working for a cocaine-addicted psychopath who literally hit his employees, I ended up as a management consultant in a small firm in a small village working with big global manufacturing companies on their supply chains. This felt like I was still delaying my career decision about where I wanted to work even more. It allowed me to see different bits of different organizations and, and see if there were, you know, somewhere I wanted to work more concretely further on. But actually my principal observation was this was all really, really boring. I couldn't see myself working in any of these places I was consulting for, nor, nor the actual place um, itself. And this really depressed me. I thought, how can I spend the next 40 years of my life doing this, these kind of jobs? And I looked around the people I was working with and for and just thought, oh God, you know, I don't want to turn out like them. It felt like they'd kind of exchanged this cozy, easy life uh, for, for boredom. And I, I didn't want to do that. Anyway, a project I was working on um, at this consultancy required some kind of analytics, some, some sort of massy stuff that ended up being fairly complicated. And it led me down a very nuanced, specialised technical path that I found really interesting and resonated with earlier interests I had in, in artificial intelligence, which at the time was probably less popular than it currently is before that, it being in an AI winter at the time. And the small changes I could make using this new field, which they call machine learning, appeared to have massive outcomes for the clients. And we managed to save them a huge amount of money using these kind of techniques. So the boss of the, the place I worked said I could go and do another master's in this new field. And here I came to Sussex at the, uh, what's called the EASY M e MSC, because of the acronym Evolution and Adaptive Systems. And I loved the multidisciplinary nature of the course. One of the things Sussex is really good at is linking together quite different subjects to an overall theme. I think it was the first university to do computational neuroscience, for example, which featured on this course. And I also found the place really open-minded and progressive unlike Cambridge, as you might imagine, uh, and actually some of the other universities I've been associated with more recently. And this is a photo taken a few years ago of, of protests happening on, on the campus. Um, and I think one other sort of sub message I wanted to make to people watching this course is you probably take a lot of this stuff for granted, but it is something that pervades everything, you know, Sussex does. Um, as an institution. And, and, you know, I've been involved with about five universities now, and by far the one I've engaged with the most is Sussex. So don't take it for granted. You know, you, you're, you're lucky you are somewhere like this and not somewhere that doesn't stand up for what it believes in or care about the, the world as a bigger picture in anything other than a kind of academic sense. Anyway, Despite the generosity of, of, of the employer who basically paid me to come to Sussex, I felt like I had to get out of my comfort zone, lest I turned out like the kind of people I didn't really like around me or want to be like around me. I wanted to do something completely different. So completely pivoted and became an interest rate derivatives trader in an investment bank. It was really well paid, really fun and felt glamorous, even though I was only moving money around and sort of hoping it stuck to my fingers, really. I was surrounded by people who spent their days getting taken out for amazing lunches, browsing for fine wines and auction at Sotheby's, and chatting at people. And I started to get really bored into this hedonic treadmill. But thankfully, even that wasn't enough. I wanted more money and more interesting work, so started a PhD and moved more and more into rarefied aspects of financial services like high-frequency trading. I continued to gamble higher and higher 
paid stable jobs for more and more esoteric roles with abandon. I know I look back at this period of my life and think I was insane. But again, glad I didn't temper my restlessness or misplaced belief that things were carrying on as before. But I drifted very far from the young man who wanted to cure the world's water problems to someone who wanted as much money as possible. I justified it a little bit with the fact that I could do more good with the money. But it's very hard to spend time with people conspicuously consuming without it rubbing off on you. One thing I was grateful for is my family and friends were all a bit suspicious of me earning money and kind of thought it was just a phase. And some things do stick in my mind at, at those times. There was a guy who sat opposite me at a well-known Swiss investment bank who had photos on his desk of his expensive sports cars and not his kids or anyone else in his family. And the other thing was that kind of arms race that used to form of people with their watch sizes, people showing off their bigger and bigger watch sizes and how much money they spent on them. Another like, probably fairly obvious point is that a lot of people who make lots and lots of money are obsessed about it and not very interesting people. Anyway, I finally got sacked and had to take stock of where I was. Um, and, and that was someone who'd completely forgotten all his ideals and was completely un entrepreneurial. I'm someone who finds it quite hard to theoretically feel about something. I have to do it and then realize it was a silly thing to have done in the first place. And I like to gorge on things like doing properly. So I kind of feel like the investment banking thing was something I needed to purge in my system. And if you can cope with the snake pit that forms in the bonus culture, you can kind of cope with the politics in most organizations afterwards. So here's patronizing lesson number two. You should probably go for it. When you do make these experiments, there's no point doing it half-heartedly because you're not going to learn as much. And, and in some ways, you can't really fail if you're learning. So you know, I encourage people to sort of gorge on their career experiences. The other one is, and this may be almost the exact opposite of what I'm saying, is that if you're feeling miserable and you don't know why, maybe it is because you're suppressing some conscience in your head somewhere um, that's, that's sort of trying to guide you back to your what you should be doing. And lastly, your parents, as annoying as they are, are usually right knowing what's good for you, as are all the other people around you. Anyway, annoying um, as that part of my career was, it drifted me into a kind of portfolio career where I tried doing lots of things at the same time, forecasting fine wine prices, predicting ambulance call outs, but none of these got anywhere. And that's because I was trying to do too much at the same time. And this is kind of the point after you've done your experimenting, I'll get to the lesson, but if you, if you keep jumping around or doing too much at the same time, you don't build up frustration tolerance um to navigate all the kind of setbacks you're going to get when you want to do something properly i think this is a kind of this is a really important lesson is at some point you've got to stop the experiments and you've got to kind of double down and do something properly and you know where it's kind of like exploration exploitation spend a while checking everything out not getting too stressed that you you know you've spent 15 20 25 years doing it and you think, oh, I quite like this thing, and you go for it. Um, and and I think if, if you care about regret minimization, you know, don't look back in your life and think, I wish I'd done this, this, and this. This is a good approach. Um, it, you're least likely to be dissatisfied at the end. So my current focus, as mentioned earlier, is, is my company, Chai. Um, it's the culmination of everything I've done, both hard and soft-wise skills I've learned. Uh, despite it being the only thing I do, it involves every aspect of my personality, from the kind of the technical geeky stuff to the sort of leadership and, and you know, being, trying to be good with people and, and even selling. And it's been a privilege having something like this to focus on in these difficult times. Um, I think a lot of people think they should be building companies right from the beginning of their careers, but I just don't think that's possible until you've had the life experience of, of work, understanding the business world about having had knockbacks. And I think a lot of attention is given to sort of really young people who've come straight out of university and founded billion dollar companies um, in their mid twenties. I just think that's that maybe what the media represents, but the reality is very, very different. So again, it's okay to take a while before you, you try and build these places. Anyway, my last final slide that sort of ties this together is you don't have to be 
building an NGO or founding a new charity to make the world a better place. Every little interaction you have with every human being makes a difference. And actually the more senior you get and the, you know, uh, as you rise to a company or wherever, the more leverage you have, the more people you influence. And I used to think that all that mattered was that you had to change the world through some massive act of benevolence or invention. But actually, you can set lots of virtuous cycles up that try and inspire people around you to become better versions of themselves, and obviously including yourself. And if you show everyone you work with, no matter how apparently senior you are to them or whatever, or the utility they may represent in some horrible way of looking at people, if you show them all kindness and respect, it will make everything better, make the world a better place. And in almost the opposite way, the conspicuous consumption seems to sort of rub off on people. And one piece of advice was given very early on in my days of, of banks by a particularly sage person was you should judge the quality of a role or opportunity by the quality of the people you work with. And I think, you know, you start off your career with that maxim, you go very, very far and be very happy and look back with a great amount of satisfaction. And yeah, I really like this quote that act as though everything you do makes a difference because it does. And also psychologically, like trying to think the other way around is horrendous. So you may as well choose to think like this in a kind of task asked way to sense. Anyway, thank you very much for your uh, patience in listening to me and to my patronizing life lessons. Thank you, Tristan. A round of applause. <laughs> um, that was a really interesting talk and it was great to see your career journey and the values that you've carried with you from your time at Sussex Uni, um, particularly as someone who's just starting their career journey or will be in a couple of years. I found it really insightful and I'll definitely take a lot away, away from it. So thank you. Um, so my first question for you, Tristan, what advice would you give to students when researching the culture and values of the companies they're applying to? So, I mean, this is something I always want to do is actually just try and meet somebody, work somewhere. You can, people talk about what they want the culture to be, and that's at least they've made an effort, but it's the people obviously that represent the culture. So chatting to people at that company and even better people who've left the company because the people in the company have drunk the Kool-Aid, they're towing the party line. You're not necessarily going to get a, a real view. If you can find people that have just left the company and, and understand why they've left and just give them to get, give an open conversation on, on why and what it's like, that's the best thing. It's slightly harder to do, but always worth doing, particularly in, in smaller places. Great, thank you. Um, and moving on to the second question, uh, what aspect of society do you think stands to benefit the most from innovations in technology? Stands to benefit, um, I would say climate change. What is more important than climate change? We're all in a lot of trouble. Uh, it really annoys me when people pretend we're not. I think there's a danger that people get complacent about technology. So I was thinking about this with COVID. You know, if we if if vaccines are seen as being a way of getting us out of COVID, people are going to go, oh look, technology, technology can save us from this. And they'll start thinking it's okay to go and fly everywhere and pollute, uh, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. But there is also a possibility we will uh, sort of solve a lot of problems in the climate change space with technology. And we should certainly be trying. Um, and that can be in terms of energy production. It could also be being more intelligent about use of materials all the way to agriculture. I think taking the agricultural narrative further, I will say I'm a big fan of like the Green Revolution, the Norman Burlab and all that kind of stuff that happened, I guess, in the 60s, I think. And I think, you know, improving crop yields and, and feeding people and feeding them in a way that's more sustainable is really important. And I think technology, you know, if you think about, um, Stuff happening in genetics and uh, and that kind of area, I think is really important there. And then probably lastly, medicine. Um, you know, clearly public health has become prominent again in in what we're all experiencing now with COVID, but also with precision medicine, with with kind of building up drug discovery for targeting particular diseases. Not so much sort of increasing longevity for the privileged people who make it to their seventies, but actually the people the vast majority of people who don't get anywhere close are bringing down that average, trying to trying to find ways of ameliorating suffering and making their lives better through sort of uh, advances in medical technology. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, there needs to be a, a sort of emergence of people coming together 
with technology to sort of solve these issues. Yeah, so thank you. So how do companies using artificial technology feel about the ethical side of artificial intelligence? Um, for example, the impact it has on jobs. Uh, so I think, how, how should they think about it? Or how, how do they? How do they? Um, yeah, so I think a lot of people don't, or a lot of people basically do what they want and then retrofit uh, what, what they should say out there in the open. I think I'm going to slightly be a politician about this and, and slightly not answer the question and slightly answer a slightly different one, which is, I think we have an obligation to deal with the job fallout from all of this. You know, we think about Thatcher as an example of someone who like society needs to be like this. I don't care about the short term pain of all these people jobs being decimated because it's good for UK PLC if we move away from the primary economy to sort of more services. And, and that was horrendous. You, you can make arguments different ways on whether it was good for everyone in the long term. It was obviously awful for the communities that were destroyed. The reality is with AI is you're not going to get sudden mass job displacements. It's going to be more gradual. And I don't buy that people can suddenly reskill and you can get all these truck drivers to learn how to be computer programmers. That's nonsense. And CEOs just being dismissing it because it's not their problem. So, so that's not true, but it isn't going to happen overnight. And society can deal with it with things like temporarily universal income and other things like that. So I think we're, I think there's a little bit of like everyone's terrified in the press. We're all going to lose our jobs. It's not going to happen overnight. It's take everything's taking a lot longer than people thought it would. And I'm not sure I'd look to the companies doing the displacement of change to, to have the responsibility. I think it, that's unrealistic. I think it has to be a society level, you know, kind of governments and state. Yeah, and I think that sort of feeds on from what we're taught in the university. Um, some of the things we learn about AI is always the dark side and mm. the damage it can have. Um, yeah. So I, sort of, I, I think some of that feeds on. on to I, I, I would say that I'm going to sound very defensive now. Um, I've been asked a lot about the sort of dark side of AI. And I, I think, you know, I've been asked this by like really prestigious journalists who should know better. And I've be, literally been asked, you know, when's Terminator going to turn up and silly things like that. And I'm like, well, a lot of AI is really pedestrian. It's really not very exciting. It's not Arnold Schwarzenegger shooting Linda Hamilton. It's, it's like making people's lives better through medicine, through better I know, credit provision and stuff like that. And it's very mundane. And as a consequence, it doesn't make it into the, to the news. The, the kind of scary stuff doesn't, we're so far away from a lot of the less benign use cases. It's, it's, it's a bit like worrying about, I think this is what Elon Musk said, it's a bit like worrying about overcrowding on Mars right now before yeah. we've even got people going out there. So I think we have to worry about the job displacement thing, but in every other sense, don't worry about it. Yeah, I agree. Um, so the next question, what is a particular challenge or weakness you have faced and how do you overcome it? Some I think you style question, sorry. Yeah, well, so, so I'll tell you my answer. So if someone asks that in a job interview, the classic one is that you're a perfectionist. I mean, to the point, it's a bit cheesy. With me, the, uh, the reality is, is, is this kind of boredom problem if, and, you know, kind of not wanting to be pigeonholed and do just one thing and, and just and being rubbish at it. So I was rubbish when I was just given this job and do this thing. Um, and basically I'm optimized for the kind of level I'm at now, you know, as a CEO who gets to do a little bit of everything and when he gets bored of it, someone else has to do it. But, but it took me a long time to get to that point. So it was awful until I got there because I, I was someone to do this. Well, I, don't have to. I, I didn't have that frustration tolerance or the kind of in, enthusiasm to just do one thing on its own sake. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the last question, um, you mentioned about experimenting in your career, especially mm. whilst you were young, um, but also the importance of going all in in everything you do. How yeah. do you maintain a balance and well-being whilst doing both? So balance, I, I, I've generously got my, my sister-in-law Rosa here. I think but she would agree balance is not some a term that's usually applied to me at all. I, so, I, you know, I've almost gone deliberately the opposite in my whole life, well, nor is well-being really. I just sort of get on with it. And I'm not balanced. So I'm not the person to opine on either of those two characteristics. I, you know, for, for other people, I would think about it as exploration, then exploitation. You, you know, you spend some time trying to figure out what you want to do, and then you go like that. Because if you're trying to do both at the same time, yeah, you, you will go mad, I suppose. 
so I guess that sums up our interview section. Uh, thank you for your um, talk and the interesting answers you gave in the interview.